in the Senate, Republicans will spend the next two years in the minority. And Mitch McConnell will retain his grip on the leadership post in that caucus. We caught up with Senator Josh Hawley on the record. Hey, Mark. Hi, Senator Hawley. You, you so, uh, you've spoken rather stark terms about the midterm election results. You said they were the funeral for the Republican Party as we know it. The Republican Party as we have known it is dead, in your words, saying that we're not a majority party. The old party is dead. Time to bury it and build something new. If you're going to eulogize someone, the least you can do is name them. Whose Republican Party is dead? Donald Trump's? Well, I said the party of the last 30 years. I mean, listen, since 1988, the Republicans have won a majority of the popular vote in a presidential election, I think just twice. I mean, you can do the math and make sure I'm right about that. But it's been a long time since we have been a consistent majority. And I think what these last elections show is that a lot of independent voters who voted for Barack Obama and then turned around and voted for Donald Trump, who don't like Joe Biden, but did they vote this time? No, a bunch of them stayed home rather than vote for Republicans. I think that ought to tell Republicans something, that you can't just be against the Biden agenda, as terrible as it is. We're going to actually have to go out and appeal to these working class independent voters. And we do that with an agenda that actually protects their jobs, that protects their families, that protects our culture, that secures our border. But Republicans really didn't have any agenda on offer. And I think that's the lesson we've got to learn. Mike Pompeo said this, quote, we need more seriousness, less noise, and leaders who are looking forward, not staring in the rearview mirror, claiming victimhood. It sounds like he's alluding to the former president, who, as you just pointed out, did not win the popular vote in, in 2016. Is Mike Pompeo a part of that new Republican Party you see moving forward or part of the old GOP you're declaring dead? Well, I think that depends on him. I mean, it depends on everybody to decide, are they going to be part of the solution or part of the problem? Are you going to put forward ideas that actually reach out to these voters that we need? We're not going to be a majority party unless we appeal to working people and their families. And we're not going to do that if we keep running on the same old tired stuff. If you keep running on a, a trade agenda that sends our jobs overseas, that impoverishes towns all across our state, like the one that I grew up in, if you're going to keep running on that agenda, you're going to keep losing. If you keep backing the big corporations in Wall Street, overworking Americans, you're going to keep losing. That's my message to the Republican Party. I think voters are trying to send them that message. We'll see who listens. That pro-worker message uh, is a more populist one, might be more popular with the public, but the Associated Press reported that many, you also in, infused in your uh, campaign strategy or your future GOP strategy, talk of culture and indoctrination of youth. The Associated Press just said that uh, two-thirds of the candidates who run who ran on platforms like those for school board races lost. Candidates who ran in statewide elections for governor on the same platform about indoctrinating kill, uh, children running against those ideas. Go uh, candidates for governor in Michigan, Wisconsin, Kansas, and Maine all lost. Why do you think that's a winning message? Well, look at Ron DeSantis in Florida. Look at McMaster in North Carolina. Look at Brian Kemp in Georgia. Uh, these are Republicans who ran on a I mean, what was DeSantis boasting about? Florida's where woke comes to die. They had massive margins in that election. That was an election that was about something. You know, the election in New York where you had a strong anti-crime candidate. Yeah, the governor's candidate, he didn't win ultimately. He came awfully close, but Republicans won up and down the ballot in New York on a strong message of protecting families, of getting tough on crime. That's a real message that has real substance to it. That's the kind of thing we as Republicans have to be fighting for. And yeah, I, I do believe 100% protecting our culture, protecting families, protecting parents' rights to say what their kids' medication is going to be. You know, kids shouldn't go to our schools and get indoctrinated, taught to hate this country, taught that their gender isn't the right one and, and they need to transition behind their parents' back. This has got to end. Parents don't want this. Look at Virginia. How did Glenn Youngkin get elected? I think that voters are sending a pretty clear message. The problem is, is that too many Republicans, especially the Washington Republicans, they just haven't been listening. It sounds like you're open to moving on from Donald Trump. Are you open at all to running for president yourself? Oh, I've said that my focus in 2024 is, is being a Senate candidate. I hope that the people of Missouri will have me for another term. There'll be time for more of that later on. But uh, my plan and hope is to run for reelection in 2024. A quick matter back home. A Missouri court just ruled that when you were attorney general, you, quote, knowingly and purposely violated the state's transparency laws in an effort to conceal potentially damaging information and help your political campaign. Now taxpayers are on the hook to pay a $12,000 fine 
in the attorney general's office. Why should taxpayers pick up the tab? Shouldn't you pay for that? Uh, that's not what the court ruled. The court did not find that I did anything wrong. And in fact, this partisan attack, which has been going back to the last campaign by Claire McCaskill for four years now, Democrats have alleged I did this and that wrong. I violated these laws. There have been multiple investigations, including by a Democrat auditor into me personally. Every one of them has exonerated me, have found no wrongdoing on my part whatsoever, including, as I say, the Democrat auditor, including the Secretary of State. There have been numerous lawsuits and various other pieces of litigation. I've been exonerated every single time. Are, are you suggesting somehow that partisan politics have infected the nonpartisan Missouri plan, the, the Missouri uh, courts are somehow playing politics? No, I'm saying that you don't know how to read an opinion. What your characterization of the decision is totally wrong. You should read it. You should also read the investigative reports of the Secretary of State, the investigative report of the state auditor who investigated me personally based on these baseless attacks, these partisan attacks. You've got Claire McCaskill out there again now amplifying this. This is an attack she started and litigated in the last campaign. It's been disproven every time. I personally have been investigated and exonerated by Democrats in state office every single time. As you can see from time to time on this program, we have to set the record straight. So let's check the record, shall we? Here are some of the court records that Senator Hawley just referenced and asked us to take a closer look. Daniel Hartman is the name of someone who used to work for his AG campaign. He was also the custodian of records for the Attorney General Josh Hawley himself in that government office. Hartman was a state director for Hawley's AG campaign and had a campaign email address. You see that in the court records. Also, when Democrats hit Hartman with a Sunshine Act request searching for public emails on his personal account, he claimed that Hawley's government office retained no documents like that. Turns out that was not true. Later, the American Democracy Legal Fund filed a complaint alleging Hawley used government funds to boost his Senate campaign. That complaint would trigger many of those partisan investigations into Hawley's office, the ones he just referenced. But those investigations were separate from this new court finding. That's key here. The question at hand now is, did the Attorney General's office violate the Sunshine Law by failing to turn over documents that existed on its servers? Cole County Judge John Beatham, a Republican, writes, quote, This court holds that it did. The court says Hawley's office violated the Sunshine Law in at least two ways, failing to provide a detailed explanation for its delay in handing over the documents and by withholding those documents for nearly a year and a half. But did the senator have a point? Was this somehow misinterpreted the way we asked him that question? The court says this, none of the arguments from the attorney general's office justified its violation of the law. Further down on page 13, the court says Mr. Hartman, as a custodian of records, quote, must do his job and warned the attorney general's approach is unprecedented and creates a roadmap for abuse that would allow an agency and its custodian to shield public records merely by storing them off site. Perhaps the most important lines in this new court decision are these. The violations of the Sunshine Law in Attorney General Josh Hawley's office were knowing and purposeful. The court says by failing to produce the records, Mr. Hartman and Hawley's office prevented an opposing party from accessing documents that were potentially damaging to his political campaign. The court says the conduct in Hawley's office supports the court's findings that the violations here were knowing and purposeful. Further, on page 16, the court says the fact that this public business was conducted through and stored on private email accounts is direct contravention of the AGO's official policies. It itself evidence of a cover-up. And one more time, just for emphasis, the judge writes this. A litigant cannot avoid summary judgment by simply denying the veracity of the movement's facts. This court finds Josh Hawley's office knowingly and purposefully violated the Sunshine Law. That is going to cost Missouri taxpayers $12,000, not the Hawley campaign, but $12,000 to Missouri taxpayers. Now, we'll set the record here straight, too. When I asked Senator Hawley the initial question, I said the court found him knowingly and purposely uh, had violated the Sunshine Law, when in fact it said his office had done that and perhaps benefited his campaign. Perhaps Senator Hawley makes a distinction between himself and his office or between himself and his campaign. Perhaps he meant to say that those things went on uh, in his office without his personal knowledge. He didn't answer that question specifically. Maybe that's what he meant. Perhaps he also meant to lay blame on one of his staffers, Daniel Hartman. But our question stands. 
If his campaign could have benefited from a cover-up, then why are the taxpayers the ones paying for that fine? I should also set the record straight on one other fact that was inherent in my question. I asked Senator Hawley if partisan politics might have crept into the nonpartisan Missouri courts plan when in fact the judge who issued this ruling was elected through a partisan process. Turns out not every county in Missouri participates in that nonpartisan Missouri plan that's designed to be a firewall between politics and the judiciary. Judge Beatum was elected in a Republican primary. And just for good measure, we reached out to Senator Hawley's campaign now, the active campaign, just to make sure, would they in fact cover the cost of that $12,000? Here's the response from Kyle Plotkin with the campaign, quote, these allegations are based on Democrat campaign attacks. They have been investigated multiple times and no wrongdoing has been found, including by a Democrat state auditor. Not until this new court ruling found there was a violation of the law. Again, no direct answer on whether or why not the campaign would pick up that tab and leave it with the taxpayers.